Hi everyone. If you're a trainer, a clinician, or someone who's experienced a terrible amount of back pain, the name Dr. Stuart McGill means something. I met Stu back in 2006 as an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo when I was studying kinesiology. And I remember taking his class and just realizing how he just exemplified excellence and mastery of his craft. Stu commands a presence in whatever room he's in. And it's because he's just that good of a researcher, a clinical professor, and a good man. And so this conversation is, for me, is long overdue because I've gotten to know Stu over the years, but I really wanted to have a conversation about what makes him tick. What, uh, how does he approach research problems? How does he view clinicians and trainers? What frustrates him? What makes him optimistic? And just generally understanding man. Enjoy this episode. Hi everyone, episode 13, and I am so honored to have someone who I call friend and someone who I've known for some time, Dr. Stuart McGill. Stu, how are you doing? It's been some time since we've really connected. Well, good morning, Rupesh. I am fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. How about you? Well, you know what? I'd like to say that I'm, I am pretty good. The weather here is not that favorable still. Edmonton is still a little bit colder. I'm, I'm pretty sure the tides have turned in Gravenhurst though, is that correct? Uh, I was out welding a dock on the ice yesterday. Oh, so okay. <laughs> I, I love the ice. It's my uh, work platform. So yeah. uh, when you say the weather's turned, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I remember Ontario summers, or not summers, the spring, sorry. I should, we're, we're, they were warm up by this time though. Well, has that not, not been not, your experience recently? Not in Muskoka, maybe okay. down at the university where we both okay. work. Yeah, but uh, no, I so enjoy living north. Yeah, yeah. And first, I got to ask you though, how has this pandemic year been for you? Has everyone kind of stayed healthy? What's the situation like in in Gravenhurst? Uh, I hate to gloat. We really don't have a, a pandemic. Uh, situation. Now, having said that, I'm not dismissing the cautionary approaches that we're all yeah. taking, Yeah, yeah. but I don't know of anybody. We have a uh, next door neighbor, but one is the uh, is a nurse in emergency at the local hospital. Uh, she was telling me, you know, they hadn't had a COVID person for a month. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we, we are doing very, very well. Uh, I, I think the government, uh, both federal and national, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. national and local, have done a fabulous mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. job, at least around here. And uh, we're so uh, now I don't know if you asked that question about me personally. I mean, it's it, we can maybe this is something else that you wanted to talk about, but COVID uh in a way has been a bit of a blessing for me personally because mm -hmm. as you know i retired from the university mm -hmm. four years ago approximately mm -hmm. four or five now mm -hmm. and i was still too willing to respond to people's requests oh would you come and put on a course in mm. another country or somewhere and uh but what COVID has done is it canceled all the travel it forced me to put my courses online and become more comfortable in that realm and my life has drastically improved so do you not expect to really travel as much after this pandemic is over correct okay so not not even for courses and such it's that it's mainly I don't, I don't okay. think i'll do it ever again 
Okay. I, we, we have outstanding instructors who mm -hmm. can go on site live. The model that we've built now is uh, I can come in on the Jumbotron or yeah. <laughs> Zoom or whatever, yeah. uh, start the conference, uh, and my outstanding teachers, and you know them, Ed Cambridge. Great. I don't know if yep. you ever met Joel yep, I uh, Proskowitz. No, I haven't. And, yeah, he's based in London, England. But okay. nonetheless, they, they do the uh, expert on site hands-on skills development teaching yeah. and the rest is uh, all can be accomplished by zoom so i i'm i'm doing really well my life is wonderful so i i know a lot of people are hurting but that's just uh, uh... well you know it's no i i agree with you i i have found for me um you know on my end people have been healthy and everyone's been good I feel like the pandemic has also been an opportunity for folks to really focus on themselves, right? Like to kind of slow things down and, and do a lot more inner reflection and, and, and do some professional development and, and figure out what they kind of really want in life. Do you feel like just by the nature of not, you know, I know you're, I know you keep a rigorous schedule, but do you, do you find like you've been able to just rest and reflect and, and do those kind of good things? Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said. So not talking about me for a second, but you, you started the question talking mm. about people broadly. And as always, different people respond differently. And I agree with you with some people have made fabulous transformations mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. lives. They have refocused on the importance of their family. And, uh, you know... Uh, I, I had a colleague, uh, he was a technician at the, he, he is a technician at the university, he's a good friend. And uh, I remember a couple of years ago, we were just talking philosophically, mm -hmm. what, what, what's your perfect life? And he said, my perfect life would be able to put my daughter on the school bus in the morning, work a little bit at the university i can do a lot of my technical work at home on the computer in my workshop and then be there to pick up my daughter make dinner with her that would be my perfect life yeah guess what covid did yeah it I know. gave him his perfect life and he's so thankful uh and then the next person uh they might have worked in the entertainment industry or in the uh, restaurant business and they lost their job yeah. and they've really suffered trying to find a way to utilize their skills in a fulfilling way. So do you, you see what I mean? It's, it, 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 it's like we're seeing these kind of dualities, right? Like, yeah. which is, and, and it's, it, it is heartbreaking of course, to see those, you know, how many small businesses are not going to come back as a result of this? I'm not sure what, what you feel like. Well, I mean, you kind of said in Gravenhurst, you know, luckily it hasn't been so bad, but I'm not sure how it's affected small businesses there. But I can tell you, I mean, certainly in Edmonton, I don't expect that there will be a lot of, you know, coffee shops and restaurants that are going to be reopening. And I remember certain businesses just starting before the pandemic. Like it is absolutely heartbreaking to see what's happening but then you're right, I see the opposite end of where people are really taking the time to reinvest in themselves. And that just gives you that optimism that, you know, maybe we'll be able to kind of get through this. And I think it also provides a good point of transformation. What do you think? Agreed. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I agree. Uh, what was going through my mind as you were saying that is uh, I live in a small town. I, mm -hmm. I know <laughs> not everybody, but almost. Yeah. And uh, it'll be up to us to support one another as we're trying to do now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably the worst person in the world because we sell our textbooks on Amazon. <laughs> but but I, I really try and buy as local as I can. That's just a conscious yeah. effort to uh, support the uh, people who, and you know, the old saying goes, who's the sponsor of your kid's baseball team? Mm -hmm. It's not Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your yep. friend down the road uh, who, who it, it, you know, you, you, you tighten your circle and you try and support it. Yeah, yeah. I know you. I know you do a lot of these podcasts. I, I got to ask you though: are you, are you getting tired of some of these things? 
I, I YouTubed you the other, probably a couple of weeks ago and starting to prepare for this conversation. I noticed that, man, he's doing like almost one a week or like several a month. Like, and it's all about like, you know, I know, I know you love what you do and it's all about the, it's all about the spine and, and I'm hoping to talk to you about stuff today that is not necessarily with the low back, although, you know, I'm sure we can have a nerding out session about that. But, but is that, is that, are you getting tired of this a little bit or is it still kind of fresh? Well, here's how I'd answer that. I have an expertise in back pain and things surrounding that topic. You mm -hmm. know, I love the puzzle of taking an athlete and figuring out what is the mechanism of their pain and their disability and reducing the causal mechanism and then building a foundation for them to regain their athleticism. And then the final joy for me is to get them back on the podium. Right. So that's what turns my crank, so to speak. Uh, I am really uncomfortable being in public now. You're asking me questions that I don't have any more expertise on than anyone else. If you want to ask me a spiny thing, wonderful. I'm very confident with that. There's, but there's far too many people on the internet who are giving their criticisms and their opinions on things that I don't think they're qualified to do. And now you're doing that to me. And it's the thing that I, I, uh, I, I really am discouraged by. So <laughs> you, you, you're asking me, uh, uh, anyway, let, let's see where this goes. And the rider <laughs> on it is I have no more expertise than anyone else on but, some of the you know, things I think you're going to ask me. <laughs> well, I, and, and you know what, though, you're, I've known you for some time. And, you know, even though you're this spine expert, you're incredibly reflective and thoughtful and you uh, like uh, just because you might not be the expert on some of these questions i don't think any of these questions i don't know if anyone's an expert on some of these questions that i'm about to ask you and so um, i think part of this is that what i've noticed in some of the conversations you've had with other podcasts or just interviews or things like that is people might be lacking a perspective of what makes you tick right and and the man that you are and i think that's that is really informative because even if someone's not going to spine biomechanics or going to be a clinician or a trainer i always find that i can draw from you know any kind of professional if i just understand what their motives are and how they approach things and so so I, that's what really i want to want to have a conversation with you about because i mean when when i took your course when i first met you in 2006 Stu, and I say this very much objectively, you were by far the best lecturer that I had ever had ever encountered. And part of that was because of your dedication and your your you exemplified this sort of excellence and mastery about what you were doing. And you and you and we're going to talk about this, but you know, we've you and I have kind of discussed this a little bit about this notion of not being average. And so I just think that people are going to benefit from this conversation, even if they're you know, people might be surprised perhaps about like, oh, this is not a spine conversation, but I, I, I'm confident that people will get something useful out of that. So I don't, I, even though this might put you in a little bit of an uncomfortable position, I think you need to give yourself a little bit more credit than you than you might not be giving yourself right now. So, well, I, again, I don't know how to respond to that, Rupesh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's you know, it, well, maybe I'll. Uh, you you still see me as a professor, perhaps. I still, you know, I'm thinking of Rupesh back in the right. early 2000s, and we've uh, both uh, grown and gained a little bit of wisdom since that time. And and now we're I'm seeing you as a dad and a mm -hmm. and a uh, very accomplished in your job in in uh, the leadership you're you're giving in your government jobs and uh, well, thank public you. health policy and and yeah. everything else. I'm very proud of of what you've uh, done. Um, I, 
I guess what I'm trying to say is you looked at me back in 2006 as probably an old man with with all of this wisdom. And, and, and I can say this. Mm. I've, as patients, you know, we get patients from all around the world. Mm. We, we get royal family members, believe it mm. or not, top, top athletes, uh, mm -hmm. multiple you know, world champions, uh, presidents of countries. Mm. Um, I've seen prime ministers. Uh, I've seen top, top business leaders, some of the, the richest people in the world. Pain strips every single one of them down to their base humanity. Mm. And you realize that, yes, they're lucky. They're slightly odd they have some characteristics that are very odd and extraordinary but at the end of the day when they're all stripped down and they're telling you about their pain you realize just how ordinary all of us really are wow and uh i wouldn't want to be any of them by the way uh but you realize how everybody is is just hurting a little bit inside despite the bravado and the public personas that some of these people have uh would i really take some wisdoms from some of the top business leaders i wouldn't not mm. from my personal finances i wouldn't uh mm. you know would i do what some of the professional athletes have done when they're sitting in the chair in front of me saying professor or Stu or however they're out talking to me if i'd known it was going to hurt this bad i never would have done it and these are the household names right. of sport, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. And uh, so I, I don't know if that really gives you much perspective, but it, but but it has given me some. You know, you 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 maybe saw me as someone back in those days, and now we're just two men and colleagues. Well, I was going to actually. <laughs> that was going to be my last question, actually, Stu. But since you're bringing this up, I mean. What has taught you, is there something that has, that you've learned about humans overall, having gone through this process? I mean, that is, that is incredible for you to say that, you know, when you see these presidents and all these people that we know in society, and when they experience this pain, it just strips them down and they're just this average person. I mean, right. maybe that's, that is the answer, but is there anything else that you feel like has been that, something that you've seen with working with all these people that you've just learned about humans in general? Uh, well, just simply what I said. Yeah. Uh, th th people are people at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And I remember sitting in the back of a cab in New York City. Mm -hmm. No, actually, no. Maybe it was St. Louis. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I was somewhere okay. being driven in a cab. And I said to the fellow, I said, where are you from? And he said, some country in, in North Central Africa. And I, I forget mm -hmm. the country. Was it Chad or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. And we had a conversation about what really mattered to him. And, you know, it was what exactly mattered to me. And as you meet people around the world, we're all just trying to provide for our families we're trying to make everyone around us a little bit better you know and then there are the ones who are touched by the hand of god they mm -hmm. can jump higher than anyone right. else on the right. planet or right. they can run a hundred meters in nine something seconds they've been touched by the hand of god for that one little thing mm -hmm. and usually there's a little bit of something else in their humanness that makes up for it Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of a deficit. You know, when I look at athletes who are the most explosive athletes, mm -hmm. there's a neurology there. And and I'm going back to your thesis and your mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. When you measured people who could jump and you trained them, you did squat mm -hmm. training, and mm -hmm. some jumped a little higher and some reduced right. some height off their jump. Right. You exposed right. them to the same training uh loading trying to create an adaptation and you saw the difference some people mm -hmm. increase in other words their adaptations were different why well they had different neurologies they had different geometries different but what what's so interesting is all of those explosive athletes so when you train them they can jump even higher yeah 
the profile that goes along with that is they're almost always what you would call attention deficit disorders. They're so nervous, they're ready to bounce and jump, and yet when you're coaching them, you've got 20 seconds to make your point. And then mm. their brain is off in space on something else. And yet when you work with uh, a neurology that isn't quite so explosive, they you can reason and develop logics in your coaching mm. and say, we're going to do this, this, and this. And I don't know if you've noticed it in, in your coaching, those differences. Mm. So when I say Absolutely. those who've been touched by the hand of God, they're uh, what a, we, we do a lot of pattern recognition with people yep. when we're figuring out why they have back pain. And, you know, just with the stage of my life, as soon as someone walks through the door, I'm starting to put together the patterns. When I speak to my dentist about these kinds of things, you know, she says, yeah, as soon as that person comes through the door, I know the pattern already. I know they're going to have gum disease. I, I, you know, they, they haven't had a bath. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a, it's a pattern that you're putting together. And, I was just going to say, I remember, Stu, when uh, back at the university, when you'd have patients kind of come into uh, into the office, they were always often surprised when they would have to walk in front of you and you'd, and you'd say, oh, there's a method to the madness because you'd already, you'd already start to evaluate them as soon as they entered the door. Yeah, remember, that's what that we, yeah, we would set up what we would call the clandestine tests. I would say, oh, do you mind taking your shoes yeah. off? Yeah. And, uh, I had no interest in them taking their shoes off. I wanted to see them, how they <laughs> right. bent and moved. Yeah. Or I would say, do you mind bringing your backpack over here? Or, you know, shake my hand. Uh, all, every single one was an evaluation to understand their habits and to put the patterns together as to why they had back pain. So when you go back to the taxi driver and just seeing, like identifying that there are these commonalities in, in humanity, right? Like people generally want the same thing. And then you also expose that there is these incredible individualities. Is that is that? Do you find that part it continues to make your work incredibly fascinating? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 you have to love people, and you have to love studying them. And if if uh, you've been a student of mine, as you know, uh, you can't help it. When you walk down the street, you see, oh, that person is ACL deficient in their mm -hmm. knee. That mm -hmm. person is carrying so much tension in their shoulders. I will bet $1,000 that if we went for a coffee, they'd be ending up telling me about their yeah. neck and arm pain. Yeah. Uh, or they're crunched up. You, you know, uh, you can just lay bets on what you're going to see on their MRI. You know what... You know, when you look at their, their CT scan, you're going to see a lot of plaque inside their aorta going down. I mean, you right. can just yeah. put together the patterns, and that's the fun of it. And uh, it, it, it's a sickness that never stops. My, my wife uh, often laughs, you know, uh, pre-COVID when we would yeah. go out. I, I, I could just <laughs> work a room and, and do pattern recognition. And, uh, well, you've been, so doing that was for, how, you've been doing it for so many years. I only, I mean, I did kin for eight, nine years and that, that coaching and training, but I can still look at somebody and be like, that was a power athlete. Like I can, I, and I still, my mind doesn't turn off, right? Like yeah. you're saying it's a sickness and I've only done it for a short, a short amount of time and I've kind of moved on, but I can't imagine the way your sort of your goggles work when you're looking at people. It's, it's probably a distraction I would think. Well, look at a good house builder. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, they'll come in with a uh, good house builder comes in with a level and a square and they just check to see <laughs> right. what all the workers are doing and they're doing pattern recognition in exactly yeah. the same way as us. You know, why did you frame it that way? That doesn't give maximum, you know, whatever the objective. Uh, yeah. So everybody, th th you know, that's how I started this. I, I, I don't have expertise in, in, in very worldly things. So uh, I'm very comfortable talking about uh, back pain and performance and that yeah. kind of thing. Talking about these kinds of things. Uh, it, 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 do you remember when we would go to the grad house and have beer oh, and peanuts? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that, that was a thing I used to love to do with the students. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, classroom teaching. It was all one way. Yeah. And, uh, 
uh, oh, I, I do have a story to tell you about that, but let okay. me finish this one. Sure. But the, the the real fun of it, you know, we would go to the grad house and have yep. beer and, and peanuts or a pizza or whatever. And those were the times when we really learned. Well, you would, you would always say the beer tastes sweeter at the end of the week, right? When you put in a hard, uh, hard week's worth of work. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and, you'd, come uh, by, you'd come by my office and you'd be like, so is the beer going to taste sweeter today, Rupesh? And <laughs> I felt like I always had to just make something up to not disappoint you or, or something. But, but the other thing you taught me, though, I remember at the grad house was the meaning of cheers. And I still use that. I still use... Um, because you would say you would always look at somebody in the eye, right? When you do cheers, and you, you, I remember you telling us sort of um, the reason why they used to do that. So I hope you didn't lie to me because it's like it's one of those things where, like, I remember my dad told me that um, that uh, brown brown chicken eggs are fertilized eggs, and I'd only realized that no, they just came from hens that were a different color, and I believed him for so many years. So I've been telling that story for many years. So I hope that you haven't been. Uh, leading me astray here. What did I tell you? Well, you said that you got to look back in the day in order to build trust, they had to look at each other in the eyes. And so when they do cheers, that the their drink would slip into the other person's drink. And so they had to verify that so that, you know, you wouldn't poison the other person. That, that's what I remember. But is there a twist to that? Yeah, the, no, there's a few variants of that and, okay. and ceremonies of drink and poisoning uh, back in the... Uh, dark ages i suppose yeah. um but there's there's several other uh myths that i've heard that go along with that so yeah no i i i'm <laughs> i'm happy with that one okay right. <laughs> what was that what was the story you're gonna tell me you said something uh, about uh back in uh, back in uh class or something like that uh oh well a uh, you remember my style of teaching was yeah. to try and be quite uh, interactive. And uh, I would try yeah. and bring the student experience. And it would take us into places. Now, some professors were very uncomfortable with that. They had a lesson plan. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to, you know, I'm going to teach you these facts, X, Y, and Z. And I would think, well, I'll try and teach you the facts of what you need to know, but I also want to give you some thoughts on applying them and how to solve problems mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And that, that comes from the problems that the students are dealing with. Anyway, uh, around uh, the 90s, personal computers started to mm -hmm. come. And mm -hmm. then, but before that, you know, when I retired Rupesh, I gave my final lecture. Mm. And I would give uh, pictures of when I first started in the laboratory, and there were no computers. I mean, I started and mm. in, I, I taught my first course in 1985. The personal computer hadn't been invented yet. Right. Right. And these students would come up to me after that final lecture and say, sir, how did you do your work w w without a computer? Well, <laughs> these are the recording devices that we would use, and we'd read the tapes on graphs and all this sort of stuff. But uh, anyway... Uh, uh, around uh, maybe 15 years ago, I was really getting dismayed with students who would come in with their new laptop. So they've come to the University of Waterloo mm. and mom has bought them a new Apple uh, mm. computer, uh, notebook or whatever they call them. And I would see them typing and then I'd, I'd work the room. I'd walk around the room and lecture mm -hmm. and jump off desks and do all those kinds of mm -hmm. things as I you remember. recall as yep, we would yep. we would we would teach this way and then i'd see some kid on facebook and then i, I mean they're not fooling yeah. everybody i would yeah. see everyone behind them all looking at at their screen and they had yeah. some nonsense up and so i got fed up with it so i i didn't show slides i would go back to chalk and i would develop diagrams <laughs> and flows of of logic in chalk and and i made sure i did lots of geometry so they couldn't record this on their computers <laughs> on purpose and i tried to force them to go back to pencil and paper well then i got to the point where i said all right no one brings a computer to class anymore this is impeding your learning mm. bring a pencil and paper and uh someone somehow got to central administration at the university and I was visited by teaching resources. Oh, Professor McGill, 
you're not allowed to ban computers. And I said, well, I just did. Would you show me a study, please, that says the students retain the information, they get better understanding by typing on a computer. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me because there was no studies. Right. Only I knew. I knew this because I'd been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, then... Uh, you know, the, the, the students would come to office hours and they'd say, you know, I'm really having a problem struggling with this. And I'd say, well, you've, you've typed it on your computer. You had no chance. Here's the geometry. Here's how you retain that logic in your head. Here's how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. You do it with a pencil and paper and, and develop it out. Anyway, uh, so the, the, the teaching resources person who was about... Uh, 30 years old again you know <laughs> just a young fella and uh, he said well you just can't ban them and then he, he left my <laughs> office quite uh, frustrated that well you know i still didn't let any computers in my room but anyway uh you know i got a uh, an alumni magazine from the university that reports recent research right. results uh, two or three years ago do you know what the headlines on the cover was university of waterloo study shows that students learn better with pencil and paper and no computers. And <laughs> I thought, oh, did we really need to do that study? But anyway. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I do remember, I do remember you saying during class that, um, that if p folks were taking notes to just stop taking notes and just listen to you. And I remember personally going through that, having a difficult experience um, because you're just so used to wanting to memorize and understand and, and understand in real time. But I really re I recognized that I wasn't doing that. So I remember being challenged by you. I don't know if it was the first time, but definitely um, being challenged by you to, to just put things away, listen to what you're saying. And then there will always be time to kind of do that reflection. And then the other piece that I loved about that class was the, the workshops that we would do. Because I remember that you would challenge folks, you would challenge students to be really hands-on. And if folks weren't being hands-on with like cueing on how to do, you know, certain movement patterns or how to assess um, their partners, you know, you were, you were on them for that. And, and I, I, I do want to spend some time on talking about sort of clinicians and trainers overall a little bit later, but um, it was, it was, it was a fantastic course of that. that that's, that's, that's a great story. Um, in terms of the and in, in, in recognizing the research afterwards, what do you what do you miss about being a prof and a researcher? I mean, you're still obviously the research mind. I can't imagine would just shut off, of course. But just generally, like as a professor and being a clinical researcher, what's something that you miss about that? Uh, this is going to surprise you, Rupesh. At this stage of my life, my answer is nothing. I don't miss anything. And really, why? Yeah, really. And why okay. I'm going to say that is I left for a reason. My health was declining, mm. caused by the digital age. So when mm. I started as a professor, I would teach with chalk on a blackboard, mm -hmm. and we would have all the student interactions. And then end of term, I would take the whole class to the pub, as, as you would remember. Mm -hmm. We would have a little bit of party to, to celebrate the end, and we would have wonderful discussions. And it was always student pods where we would go and have a, a beer or a sandwich or something after class. And those kinds of things I do, I did enjoy at the time. I wouldn't enjoy doing it now. Mm. But my, my, my point in all of that is... Slowly, computers took over. The mm. university was encouraging online learning. And I thought, well, online learning, that, that's not for me. Uh, I don't think it's for the students. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then uh, office hours. Students didn't really want to come to office hours anymore. Oh, sir, can I email you? No, you can't email me. <laughs> you, you get in here and we'll figure out what your real problems are. I can do pattern recognition looking right. at you and figure right. out and, and really get to solve the issue. And uh, when I started, we would handwrite our correspondence. Not anymore. It was sitting at mm -hmm. the computer doing mm -hmm. email every day. And then I would, as you know, I, I ran the department for a number of yep. years. I was yep. department chair. And I would see the young professors come into work. What was the first thing they did? They sat in front of their computer 
and then they got into email hell. They would answer an email, mm -hmm. and why they were answering that one, another one came in, yep. and then they looked up, and it was lunchtime, and all they did was answer email all day. Oh, God. And so I would, I would ban them. I would say, don't you dare start that computer till after lunch. So mm -hmm. now at least you've guaranteed a dedicated morning to the things that matter. What is mm -hmm. the biggest thing you had to get done today? Go get it done. What's the second biggest thing? Good. Now, when two o'clock rolls around, you can answer your email. You want to be a successful professor or successful in life? Do that. Anyway, uh, and so did your mind did your mind work better in the morning? Would you say like? Was oh, absolutely. That... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. But anyway, my my point in all of this is I was becoming a sitter rather than a person. Mm who would be active through my, uh, through, through my daily job. The professor's job became one that sat in front of a computer. I hated it. I was aching. My shoulders, my back, my hips. Wow. I, I was just yeah. so fed up of it. And so I said, uh, I, I'm, I'm really done with it. So, 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 when, so when, physical, if I can just finish that yeah, off, that's yeah, why yeah. I said I don't yeah. miss any of it. Yeah, Rupesh... Yeah. I have a, 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 a work routine now. It's a work play. It's a seven-day-a-week cycle. I have zero pain. I'm in my mid-60s. If you told awesome. me when I was in my 40s that I'd be in my mid-60s with no pain, I, I thought you'd be lying. I feel fabulous. I'm in the best shape I've been in for years. Everything is wonderful. So do I miss it? Sorry, but no. <laughs> How, how can anyone judge or even criticize that by any means? Um, you know, the thing that the thing that I have noticed with people who, uh, with some people that I know and and, and kind of hear from afar when they're retiring, especially if they've dedicated so much of their life to, you know, a certain set of issues or a cause or whatever, is that it almost like it becomes a part of their identity, right? And so, have you ever? I, uh, certainly, you have Backfit Pro and the work that you're you're, you're still you're still in that space. But do you feel that um, you've had to sort of redefine yourself, or you've had to like, did you lose a little bit of that identity in any way? Because I know that that is a real struggle for people. I remember my my family doctor when I was a kid. He tried to retire three times, and he just couldn't because he kept coming back to it. It was really a part of himself. Um, but I just wanted your thoughts on that. Uh, that, that's such an interesting question. You use the word identity. Have I thought about it? To be honest, or not honest, that's the wrong word. To be frank, I've never thought about it. Hmm. Rupesh, I wake up every morning and I my brain is like I'm 16. I... I'm not that sophisticated. <laughs> I think like I'm 16 and then I go and look in the mirror and brush my teeth or do, you know, <laughs> what, whatever I do. And then I look in, I say, who in hell is that old man? <laughs> and then my brain starts to think, okay, well, you're not 16. You're a little slower now. So in other words, that's my identity. I don't have one. I've, I've never mm. thought, I've, I've never, you know, you, you know the type who, who they play the professor mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they play the, the, the lawyer or they play. Mm -hmm. I'm just a kid who, gets up in the morning, goes to work, enjoys it, tries to be fair with people. I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm not, I can be very, very moody, which I get very mad at myself for, but you know, I keep trying to every day improve my soul a, a little bit, but I don't have an, an identity. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm just a, you know, my perfect day now is, you know, I, I have a, a cottage and, and, uh, a few years ago, I bought an, a little island property with my wife out in Georgian Bay. Uh, we built a cabin on it last year. My favorite day is uh, I, I I just drive an old work truck like everyone, every other family member in in yeah. you know around here. Uh, you know, my brothers-in-law and whatnot. I I just drive an old work truck. I put on my boots in the morning. I make my lunch the night before, I pack my tools into the truck, and I go out and do my thing. I don't have an identity. I'm just, you know. There's so much to... humility in what you just said, Stu, because I think that, I think people do get um, caught up and have a hard time 
letting go or, or see themselves differently um, because of um, the work that they've been doing. So the fact that you just kind of normalize yourself and you don't see anything more than what you see in the mirror every morning, I think it's, that's, a, that's an incredible amount of wisdom that you're sharing. Well, or daftness, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll tell you around here if 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 I got on my high horse they'd uh, straighten me well, out pretty quick. That's how it usually works, right? You... <laughs> yeah, Catherine's no, I not gonna I stand up for that. So <laughs> no, well, uh, honestly, I, you know, uh, I'll I'll see someone who who flies in to see me. Yeah, and they rent some fancy car to drive from the airport up to here, and and I look at that and I think really. You know, mm-hmm. what, what, what's wrong with, with, and I, uh, I, I, I couldn't stand trying to project, oh, mm-hmm. I, I have to drive X car. What the hell for? <laughs> you, you, you know, my old Ram work truck is just fine. I love it's that. comfortable. And, uh, I, I, show up at my brother-in-law's place and and guess what he's driving yeah 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 it, oh there's so much pretentious uh, <laughs> you'll make me use a bad word now no that's nonsense it's, it's, uh, that's all good oh what about uh <laughs> what about uh what about defensiveness so and i and, and i'll give you just some, some context on what i mean by that so when i did my when i did my master's thesis it was my first real exposure to having to really defend my work, right? To really understand a certain problem, what the solution or interpretation of my research was going to be, and defend it to against your questions and Bill McElroy's questions and so on. And so those two years, two, two and a half years, really trained me to to be defensive about my work, almost build a sort of a, an ego around something, right? And I remember going into my next um, my next area of work in public policy, and a professor call, called me out on that, and she said that um, it was like a work it was a uh, a working group session that I had with my class, and people were asking me questions, and I went into this defensive mode, and she said, Rupesh, if you're if you prov- um, you know, portray a tone of defensiveness, you're not going to be inviting the wisdom of the people that you're trying to work with there. And I found that, you know, that really changed the way I approach things. I, as an academic, someone who's done it for 30, 35 years, you know, by nature, you almost have to be defensive, I would think. That's an assumption I'm making, but I feel very, fairly confident in saying that. Is that something that is built into your character, or do you and, and or do you feel like um, that is something that you kind of had to just live with, and you you're, you've been able to let go of that? Well, first of all, the uh, person who made that comment to you, I think, had a lot of wisdom. It would be my base nature if someone criticized some of our work and it was not a fair criticism but one that came of malice or ignorance Mm. i want to take my hands around their neck and choke them that's my base Mm. gut reaction but you're right you 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 temper that uh as a civilian in society and that's what civil society uh, is all about. Mm-hmm. So uh, what I still get irritated with is people primarily on this platform called social media. Mm-hmm. And they will say, oh, McGill is this, or McGill said that, meaning that, you know, never flex your spine might be one. I said, well, wait a second. I, I Let's see now. Uh, you know what the UFC is? The uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. mixed martial arts uh, yeah. uh, organization uh, you better flex your spine if you're going to compete in the UFC sure. otherwise you're going to the hospital very quickly yeah. <laughs> well I think I have four fighters right now who I've consulted with mm-hmm. active in the UFC now if McGill didn't say flexion you, do you see what I mean yeah. And, yeah. and not one of them has ever worked with us or knows what we do or they've read a few papers well you know that is just 
uh, asking for problems. They're the world's expert now because they've read a few papers, mm. not ever having done the work themselves to know there's a lot of nuances of how all of this goes. And if we don't have a person in front of us to give context to the whole discussion, then uh, they are really represent misrepresenting uh, what you do. Now, why are they doing it? Oh, they're selling their own program on the internet or right. whatever the case may be. So that, I, my base reaction is to just, again, <laughs> but uh, a lot of, I mean, if I wanted to be crudely philosophical, if mm -hmm. I can be both of those things, of I would say, well, that's great. They just made more patients for me and all the BackFit Pro Master sure. Clinicians. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, it hurts me when a patient then calls up and says, you know, I followed this person and I did this exercise and now I have a disc herniation. Can you help me? Or, you know, now this is sweet. This is really sweet. People who've badmouthed me on uh social media then come two years later with their tail between their legs i suffered exactly what you said and what i mm. would speak out against you mm -hmm. for would you now help me i'll give you an example there was a doc a physician who mm -hmm. uh was responsible for a few UFC fighters, so, okay. so some good fighters. Yep. And he brought to me a slosh pipe. So this is a pipe about uh, five feet long, meter and a half, half full of water. And he said, would you uh, endorse this with me? Because I want to make a company and sell it. And you would rack this slosh pipe on your shoulders and you'd twist back and forth quickly. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. And he says, this creates rotational power to really get... Okay you know, uh, harder strikes uh, with my fighters and that kind of thing. And I said, well, I can't because here's what our science and the mm -hmm. years I've done on this would show. Slowly, so you got me talking about spine biomechanics now. Good. Slowly, the, 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 your spine is not a ball and socket yeah. joint system. It is collagen fibers forming the discs and they form a fabric, an adaptable fabric. And if you keep twisting those fibers back and forth, they slowly delaminate. Mm -hmm. And as they loosen up, yes, you will create rotational power for about three months on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. And then the fibers will delaminate and the radiologist will look at that and say, oh, you've got a disc tear. So I said, great, you'll great, fabulous rotational athleticism, torsional power, but here's what's going to happen. Guess what? Uh, so a year later, oh, by the way, so he left that session and he called me. He said, forgive the language. He said, you're a effing idiot. And he mm. walked out my door. This was a physician. Because you didn't endorse him. Because I wouldn't endorse it. Mm. He came back to me a year later. He said, a very different tone. Professor, I have torn my disc. I have torn the disc of one of our top fighters. Can you now help us? So, so how know. does that make, so how does that make you feel? Does that like, do you, I, 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 knowing you, I don't see you had, would have taken pride in any of that. No, of course means. not. It's a tragic no. story. It's a, yeah, it, it's yeah. a tragic story. Uh, so what can I do? I say, well, here's okay. You know, you did me a lot of wrong, sir. Mm -hmm. You 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 really trashed my work on the internet. Mm -hmm. And now, and I don't say anything. I can't go back on the internet and say this guy was a to use his language and effing. I, I I can't say any of that. All I can do is my very best to try and help him. So that's that whole thing. At the end of the day, you, you know, do I get the jolly of being a professor? Well, it didn't mean anything to me anyway. Do I get the chance to improve my soul so I can sleep a little bit better myself mm -hmm. and say that's all I can really do? I can't get into these wars on the internet. Um, and, I mean, you know, I'm a pretty flawed person as well. <laughs> so I can sit on my high horse and say these kinds of things. But that would be how I would have, uh, yeah. how that story went. And uh, Do you think that, you, you talked about social media and, 
just this environment that's being created where people can just easily criticize things. But there's also this other environment that's also happening where, and I'm sure, I, I suspect social media has a con- contribution to this, but is this attack on science <clears throat> that we're, we have been seeing for a number of years. And I, and, and so you, I guess you kind of answered my question. I was going to say, do you feel like your research has been immune from, from this increasingly, in, this increasingly attack on science? Well, no, of course it hasn't. Yeah. And it, it, it's attacked by people who are not the Rupeshes of the world who came and did the work. They are people who have read a few papers and they know just enough to sound somewhat as though they know what they're talking about, but they never mm-hmm. did the work. And, uh, I mean, every critic that we have, not one of them has done the work themselves. Uh, which I think is telling. However, social media, because they're marketers yes. and, and slick, they can get away with it. Whereas yeah. prior to social media, I think people would have vetted them, perhaps. Uh, may, maybe not, uh, actually. Now I think I'm, I think back to some of the quotes of Barnum, uh, P.T. Barnum, who said, you know, there's a sucker born every minute or, or something, mm. and his job was to hoodwink the public. Okay. And uh, may, maybe that hasn't changed. It's just yeah. done a different way. It's almost, and, and now this is where I want to get into this sort of um, this average way of thinking, because I do feel like people are shortcutting things just to to market themselves and to to make a quick buck and to be recognized. And the thing that, and if I if I may, just sort of tell folks a little uh, a story. Um, that has always stuck with me, and, and you and I have already talked about this before. Is that um, in one of in one of your classes, I remember you were you were talking about your work with certain athletes and certain uh, certain patients. And just for people who are listening to this, Stu really only sees the 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 like the worst backs or the the athletes who want to you know reach that high level of performance. It's never it's not sort of in the middle. And so I remember, Stu, you were talking about um, your approach and how you would how you would assess these people and train them. And then you just said something like, "Why be average? Like, why be, why take an average approach? Why be average?" And I remember writing that down in my notebook, circling it a number of times. I have that sticky note on my laptop for work because it's always a reminder that I like to, to just cue myself. And so, but why for you? Like when you started your research. Did you always have that mentality like that it was like you're trying to like just I don't know master something or just or just not be average in your approach like where did that come from somewhere or was that sort of something that developed over time uh, Yeah My answer to that Rupesh is first of all I don't ever remember saying that but I get emails from students you know, fairly regular. Oh, uh, sir, you you said this, and it really helped me yeah. with my life. And of course, I don't remember saying any <laughs> of this. But <laughs> anyway, um, why be average? Uh, let me see if I can create a a, a, a reasonable logic uh, on this. I think to, the answer to the question, it's in me. And, and mm. you know, I have colleagues, as you do, who are content. Mm-hmm. And I think that allows them to be average. To be content, I, I, it, it doesn't fulfill anything. You know, there's, there's just so many different takes on this. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, stay hungry. No mm. matter how good you get, just stay a little bit hungry. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, in mm-hmm. terms of satisfaction and joy in life. Um, why, why, why be average? It means that you don't go out and do something because you're you're content and satisfied. Mm. Well, that's that's not really exciting. Mm-hmm. Or making your life the, the the fabulous experience it ought to be for yourself and those people around you. 
So I mean, I'll just stop there because, you know, I, I don't have any more expertise than that other than it would bore me to tears. And I, well, I think th there are people who just love to go to work, come home and watch the television at sure. night. I, I, I don't get that. You weren't one of those. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a professor in the States. Her name is Dr. Sarah Lewis. And she says that mastery involves being attentive to the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So you kind of just describe that. I know you've worked with, obviously you've worked with a ton of athletes. What is something that you've seen with some of these athletes when you see them pursuing mastery? What is something that's always uh, No, I'm, 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 I'm there, Rupesh, and I don't know yeah. quite how to say this. I was going to say genius. Hmm. Uh, I did a podcast a few weeks ago with Mark Bell, Mark Bell's Power Project. Mm. And uh, Mark asked, are the super athletes geniuses? And I had to think about that. And I would say, you know, I had to go through my mind, well, what's a genius? Because, again, I, I think I've worked with a few that would be recognized as geniuses. But genius is one step away from madness. In other words, mm. what makes the person a super performer usually means they have some deficit in the spectrum of their humanness. Do, do you get what I mean a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I do. Yep, I do. So when I look at uh, a, and then we get had a discussion about density of neural drive and true strength. There are lots of strong men and women who will never win a strong a sure. strength competition because, you know this, strength starts with a thought between your mm. ears. And then that gets transformed into a pulse train that travels through the nerves to the muscles to create stimulus and activates mm -hmm. the muscles and does, them in, does it in certain ways. But then you have a mom who sees her child pinned under a car. Well mm -hmm. documented that she will go mm -hmm. over and pick up the front end of the car. She'll avulse her bicep, crush a vertebra, mm -hmm. you know, really damage her body. In other words, she unleashed the fuse box and had that density of thought that then transferred through to the strength and she was able to free her child. Mm -hmm. Genius athletes can do this and they can do it in a way that doesn't rip their body apart. However, to get that density, you have to have a thought equivalent of murder. You have to commit murder to your own body and be confident in that to densify that. So, you know, I've, I've worked with world's strongest man, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Brian Carroll, who just set the world yep. squat uh, record at 1,306 pounds. I know Brian really well. I, 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 if you look at the powerlifting records, I would hazard to think that close to half of them have probably seen me for back concerns. I'm doing pattern recognition. Every single one of those athletes has a personality where there's a very, very dark place. They go to that dark place. And, you know, I, I had a really interesting conversation with Blaine Sumner uh, just last week. Uh, Blaine, I've known for years. Now, Blaine said, it's okay. You can talk uh, to the public. As, as you know, I've got to sign confidentiality yeah, 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 agreements. Course, yeah. I, I, I can't talk about individuals mm -hmm. in, in, in the public. But Blaine, but anyway... Uh, Blaine would say, you know, this is so true, this whole idea of going, every one of those strength athletes has a very dark place that most people don't have. And that's why mm -hmm. they will never win at strength. You've got to go there. And Blaine would say, yeah, I'd go to another country. Oh, just to say, mention who Blaine is. He holds the world's record in Wilkes score. That's the highest combination of bench press, squat, and deadlift normalized okay. to body weight. Now, Blaine weighs over 300 pounds. I mean, he's, okay. yeah. he's up there. <laughs> right. Right. But, uh, you know, he's a fabulous, kind man. You won't find a gentler giant. They are all gentle giants. I think because they're afraid of their own dark place mm. and they, they, they know they can't go there except when they're on the platform. But Blaine will say, you know, I'll go to a different country 
and I've got to do a strength meet and something isn't right, I'm off. It, it, it's too happy here in Belgium, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, can't, yeah. I can't achieve that dark space. I can't win. My squat is 200 pounds off because I can't go to the place of murder that I need to go. Wow. And uh, anyway, so, you know, we can have these. So is that, is that a genius? You know, I, 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 th I think of Bill Kazmaier, world's strongest mm -hmm. man, who mm -hmm. with his own brain, you know, you see some guys who would bang their heads on the wall and scream and yell. Bill can feel it invade his body. And, you know, you see the sweat come on his brow, the goose pimples on his skin. He's a genius. Uh, Usain Bolt. A genius. Uh, I, I I think of George Saint Pierre mm -hmm. in uh, mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know the people again on social media who've never worked with any of the great ones. They have their opinions on you know, and they use foul language. Oh, it's just awful. Mm -hmm. But George is an example of a. He, he is the professor of MMA. He can he he he, he hangs out with the best coaches. He gets the best boxing, the best, best jiu-jitsu, the, and then the best in psychology, mm -hmm, the, the, the mm -hmm. best in philosophy. I mean, George, he's a genius, and he's able to put all this together and then repeat it and make it a habit. It, it's, it's just solid genius. So uh, that, that, when you ask that question, and I, I know I paused and people are uncomfortable with the dead space sometimes when they're talking to me, but uh, I'll, I'll go back to that single word and just say genius. When, when folks go to this dark place though, do you find that they are able to achieve balance in other parts of their life? Or are they kind of just comfortable with sort of having this imbalance because they're trying to, again, master what they're, what they're, whatever the performance that they're trying to achieve. The answer to that is it depends. Okay. Great performers generally aren't comfortable. You know, to this day, I get nervous if I have to speak in, in public. Now, now, with the amount that I've done, people would find that very surprising. But I've dealt with some of the top people in Hollywood, and they say exactly the same thing. Mm. Somehow, it's... The, the, the ability to harness some of the darkest thoughts, but it's the dark thoughts that, that drive them, mm. and they can manage it. Now, once in a while, we all screw up. You know, we have to manage that dark place with drugs or uh, a, a little bit of out-of-character behavior. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I get it. And these people will be just crucified on social media. And, you know, if I've worked with them, I, I, I really get it. And I, I just feel so sorry for them that, mm. you know, we're, we're all just so in public these days. And it's not fair that, that, that someone who <laughs> just doesn't have any experience yeah. gets to, yeah. to trash that person. And I, I, but, you know, did you, let me ask you a question now. Sure. Have you detected an awareness, and I think it's brought on because of the last experience with the President of the United States, people got savvy to how they were being gamed, how they were being played with, with social media, and now they're starting to say, oh, wait a second, I don't believe all that the way I used to. Uh, or... Have they gone the opposite way and say, "Oh no, I heard it on social media. This person's a bad person," this, or you know, what, whatever. Has this polarization occurred, or are, are oh my people goodness, that's, wisening up? I'd love I, your thoughts. That's a on that's that. a that's a really that's a very heavy and big question. Um, I would say that my initial thoughts on that is that I think the polarization has been occurring before the last president. I think the last president just sort of exacerbated something that was brewing, especially in the United States, probably since the nineties. Um, when you see, you know, during Bill Clinton's time, 
there was um, there was fragmentation starting to happen between Republicans and Democrats, and and that sort of the bipartisanship didn't really exist as much um, as it did before that. Like there used to be folks on both sides who were willing to work with each other, and then I think social media and and all these different outlets are just further amplifying that. And then you had the leader, supposedly of the free world, who is really just you know, normalizing bad behavior and making it okay. And I think that then people kind of came out of the woodwork and and either were for him or against him and just further deeply divided that. I don't think that this just goes away all of a sudden. You know, you'd really need to have people to to check their own biases. And that doesn't just happen automatically. That requires an incredible amount of effort to, I think, be able to do that. And then it's facilitated. I don't know if you've seen... Um, the documentary Stu on Netflix called Social Dilemma. Have you seen I that? I have thing? actually. I watched yeah. that with my daughter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that that's that's a really, I think, a really good way of showing how no matter what you're trying to do, even to challenge your bias, social media is just working against you because of all these algorithms that are just continuously feeding a certain perspective. So I think it requires people to maybe experience you know, you hear about uh, some of these folks who are into these conspiracy theories and then you realize it doesn't pan out. Something sort of almost um, like a major event, I think, almost needs to happen to rattle people out of where they are to move and accept a different perspective. So I can't imagine the polarization just stops all of a sudden. I think it requires a real conscious effort amongst individuals, but also society to really, to really, to really get through it. So that'd just be my initial take on that though yeah no i i, I agree 100 yeah. percent. yeah um you talked about this dark place and i kind of want to shift a little bit um to i remember hearing a story that you'd said in a couple of other podcasts and I, I i didn't know about it but it didn't surprise me where you said that somebody had come to you and they said that the pain the, the all these clinicians had said that the pain was in their head right and then that they said that if they if the pain is in their head, they don't want to be crazy. And so, Doctor McGill, you got a week before I kill myself. When you hear these kind of stories, I had another one last week. Okay, right. And so this is the, this is sort of the, I mean, this is just an example to anyone who is learning about Stu right now, the kind of patients he deals with. Does you know? There's probably I want to talk about the things that certainly make you optimistic about clinicians and trainers. But what continues to frustrate you about clinicians and trainers? Well, let me just back up when uh, you, you said the uh, patient had been told the pain is in their head. I don't know if the clinician specifically used those words, okay. but the, the patient left with this idea. Mm. You know, they may have been told, well, you're magnifying your pain. It, it's not really that bad. And so they took away from it. Oh, it's in my head. They didn't give me concrete physical things that I can do to change my pain. Or right. they did give me physical things, but they only hurt me even more. And so they they left the, the, the session with the impression that it's in their head. And now they, they, they rationalize that by saying, well, shoot, it's in my head. I'm crazy. I don't deserve to live. So I, I don't, you know... How we talk to patients sometimes, uh, and I, I do it myself, uh, and, and I think afterwards. And, you know, I end up sleeping on it, and then mm. I phone the patient the next day. And I said, you know, I, I, th those words didn't really come out of my mouth in the way that I wanted them to come out of my mm. mouth. Let's have another talk. And they say, wow, you phoned me back. Mm. No one's ever done that before. And uh, I said, well, I had to because I'm a slow thinker. I had to sleep on that one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm starting to get your a little bit. I'm starting to get that, you know, you've got pressures, man. you got to feed your kids. Right. Uh, or, uh, you know, you, you've got pressures. You live in a place where you can't go out and go for a walk at night. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a rough neighborhood. I get it. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure out something else here. Let, let's, let's, uh, or, you know, whatever it is, or I'll think, you know what, I'm going to suggest you go and see X, that person, 
will will give you a, a little bit of a thought on on this. So I, I might give a referral or what. Anyway, I, I just want to point out that yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes even in a session, I'll I'll do the best that I can in that time. But then I think about it at night, and it just the hamster gets on the wheel. Then I wake up mm. the next morning a wiser person, and I phone. Them. <laughs> anyway, going back to what was it now? What 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 frustrates me, or is what's good? Yeah, about... we'll continue. What continues to frustrate you about um, clinicians and okay. trainers, especially when it comes to the low back? I guess maybe right. just generally their approach, or right. Okay, I my brain then goes to well, there's two levels there. Do mm-hmm. we mean? all physical therapists and all chiropractors and all osteopaths and all family docs or do we mean a few so that that's my first thing so when we're talking about all of them professions i'm very very frustrated with how education has gone i'll talk about individuals in a minute so if you look at the physical therapy curriculum in the last few years they they do even less now on assessing a patient, the physical assessment, taking the history and putting together pattern recognition. Because to do pattern recognition, you got to know your stuff. You've got to know how the back works. You've got to know pathways to pain. You've got to know how um, a arthritic hip, when the person bends, that hip starts to hurt. They move away from the hip. That turns their spine. That creates a load So the disc bulge is on the left-hand side. In other words, there's a reason why the disc bulge is now on the left side at L4. It it was all there, but they don't get that anymore. So then they are much faster to dismiss a patient and say, you know, uh, my therapy didn't work because it wasn't appropriate. They didn't have the training to give the right one. And then they'll start to go down this route and say, geez, it's lasted longer than 16 weeks. It's probably not of biological origin. Uh, therefore, you must be a pain magnifier. Do you see their logic? And I get patient after patient where, no, if a proper assessment was done, the mechanism and their pain pathway would have been revealed and it would have directed a therapy to A, stop the cause, and B, uh, create a foundation to, to move. You know, I, I, I told a story a couple of weeks ago. This, this uh, patient uh, has, has back pain. Mm-hmm. And uh, every day they get out of bed. Well, uh, they go to the doc. They come to me. They've got back mm-hmm. pain, but I also know their face is all smashed up. Kind of a mm. funny story. And 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 they'll say, "Well, what happened to your face? They're missing a tooth. They're all stitched up and whatnot." And say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so I said, "Well, tell me, uh, tell me about your day." And they said, "Well, every day I get out of bed, and then." There's this garden rake on the floor, and I step on the rake because I forgot it's there. The handle comes up and smashes me in the face. And I said, oh, oh okay. Uh, so what did you do? Oh, I went to the family doc, and, and they, they said, oh, boy, you've smashed your face. Here's a painkiller for you. Mm-hmm. I said, well, didn't they ask you what caused it? No, no, they, they didn't. They just gave me a pain pill. And then I said, well, tell me about the day before. I said, oh, yeah, well, I got out of bed and I forgot the rake was there. I stood on the rake, smashed me in the face, took out a tooth. I went to the dentist and, you know, they did an implant. And Anyway, you know where this story goes? And I said to them, um, all right, uh, what I want you to do is pick up that rake and go put it in the garden shed and show me how you do that. So they bend down and pick up the garden rake, and they go, oh, yeah, there's my back pain. <laughs> I mean, it's comical. And oh, uh, so, you know, after after a week, they, they'll tell me, you know what, my, my face pain, uh, my nonspecific face pain has gone away, and my nonspecific back pain has, has gone away too. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a funny story, but uh, it, it, it's almost an extreme cartoon yeah. of somewhere in the education this is being diminished so when you why ask they, why me is that, why is that happening happening Stu? like why are they not well, spending I, as much time on assessment i have a theory okay i don't know if it's right or not but you know i've been around getting close to 40 years now yeah dealing with these clinical issues and if i take 
the physical therapy as a profession, not as individuals, because there are some fabulous physical therapists. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm only talking at the professional level now. There's a culture in physical therapy where they're very reluctant to listen to a someone who's contributed to the issues who are not physical therapists. They mm. want something to be their own. Ah, this is a physical therapy, you know. So when I first started, it was all about the pelvic tilt. If someone has a back pain, do the pelvic tilt. Do Williams's flexion exercises. And then after that, uh, oh, Robin McKenzie was anointed the mm. next guru. And then they mm. forgot about Williams. Well, wait a second. Williams worked for, it really helped some people. But then, uh, you know, uh, exclusively, they, they some became McKenzie practitioners. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, wait, mm -hmm. wait a second. It, it's fabulous for some people, but it makes some people worse. Let's explore. So as you know, in the laboratory, we, we really investigated a lot of McKenzie techniques and found out why a uh, prone press-up uh, an extension posture will resolve some discs and it makes mm -hmm. other discs worse. Mm -hmm. And it depends mm -hmm. on uh, if they're plump and how much residual height is left in the shape of the disc and the size of the spine. All of these things really mattered. And then uh, the movement from Australia came from physical therapy. Mm. Oh, if you've got back pain, chances are you've got a delayed onset to your transverse right. abdominis. Right. So now every person... And they would teach us at the university. You start with transverse yeah. abdominal training, yeah. not, not, not with an assessment. And then came so-called pain science. And I thought, well, wait a second. That's, that's an odd name. Now, the transverse abdominal people would talk about spine stability. It had nothing to do with spine stability, and not one of them had ever measured spine stability. We, we yeah. had a lot of effort, as you know, yeah. to measure spine stability, but I, I don't know of a physical therapy operation that actually measured it to see, is transverse abdominus mm -hmm. really a spine stabilizer? And as it turned out, it was how the whole orchestra played that determined spine uh, stability. But uh, anyway, and then pain science, well, wait, it's not pain science that's been going on for decades it was you know this idea of desensitizing pain and and uh, how to talk to the patient which again it it's important for some people but you can't miss the biggest driver in the next person so uh, that's the culture okay. of the profession they anoint a guru who is a physical therapist and then they follow them and they change their curriculum and then they they find well this doesn't work for everybody so they anoint the next guru and the pattern repeats so that's if you were to ask me about that profession there you go what frustrates me about some individual physical therapists they don't do a thorough assessment and uh, oh if you got back pain here I'm gonna give you a sheet of paper that says pull your knees to your chest and you know, mm. what, or, you know, can you imagine you have two different patients? One's a CrossFitter. CrossFit people, the, 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 the pattern of a CrossFit person is they are keen. They love to exercise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's their community. They're proud of it. I get it. Fabulous. Awesome. Yeah. But, yeah. but don't go to a CrossFitter and say, oh, I think you need to do a little bit more. No, you have to hold a CrossFitter back mm -hmm, a little bit and mm -hmm. allow the tissues to regain some, some pain-free tolerance and that sort of thing. Now, the next person comes in and they are a physical sloth. You can see, what time did you get up this morning? Oh, I stayed in bed till 10 o'clock. My back was a bit cranky. Uh, I said, well, did you go for a walk? No, no, I didn't go for a walk. I had a cigarette and a coffee out on the porch. And Anyway, now you have to tell that person, get moving. Yeah. So right. do, you, do, you, do you see if, if you told everybody to get moving, you'd... you'd damage the crossfitter more and you might help the sloth or uh, hold back a little bit you're you're going to help the crossfitter but you're you're going to hurt the the, the sloth so <laughs> without thorough assessment and investigation of the pathway to pain of that individual you're only operating on luck mm. and uh you know and then there are the strength and conditioning coaches who will say, oh, you got back pain, do deadlifts. Mm -hmm. You got to strengthen your back. Well, there are a few people mm -hmm. who that's a pretty good way to go about it. Mm -hmm. But if that person has an implate fracture and some edema 
in their in their uh, vertebra. Do you see how that's though? That, you just gave them. Of course. You just made them worse. Yeah. And yeah. then they don't do follow up. Well, mm. if you're a financial guy, you have to every quarter you've got to deal with the financial health of your right. company. And so it's in your face. You you get audited. You know what your score is. How many clinicians keep score? Now, as you know, we always did. I can tell yep. you exactly what our score is with subcategorized patients. If someone comes in and sitting makes them worse, uh, driving makes them worse, gardening makes them worse, but going for a walk makes them better. So there's a subcategory of patient. I know that what our score is two years later on whether they got better or not. Mm -hmm. I know if they were extension intolerant, reaching up and changing a light bulb overhead, or, you know, I know what our, we're actually better with that subcategory, by the way, oh, after okay. two years okay. than, the, than the flexion intolerant, bending tolerant. So some of our criticizers would be surprised at that. But, you know, those who've, who've been told, you've tried everything. You've done physio. You've been to the massage therapist. You've tried yoga class. You've been to the psychologist, the bend of the pain clinic. Mm -hmm. The only thing left for you is surgery. I can tell you that 95% of those avoid surgery if they follow our instructions, whatever mm -hmm. they were, because they're different for everybody. And in a two-year follow-up, they were glad that they did. So that that's a pretty good score to take 18 out of 20 people who've been told they need surgery and, and they've found a strategy to avoid it by knowing with precision their pain pathway, doing something to mitigate the cause and then building them uh, a foundation for moving. Anyway, I don't know if that's where you wanted to go. No, that's exactly that. what I wanted to go. But, and, uh, and so, so just to quickly um, sort of synthesize that, so this sort of, at least from uh, when you talk about all professions, the education system is not necessarily con where it needs to be. And you're talking about, w at least with physical therapy um, uh, training, you know, the lack of assessments and, and so on. And then on the individual level, the sort of not only not knowing how to do those assessments properly, but then the follow-up is, is, is not as as good as it, as it should be. Can I, I can I add? Okay, okay, can I, may I also just say though, there are sure. some individual physical therapists who are fabulous, but right. every single one of those has had to invest in themselves. So yes. you're talking earlier about investing in yourself and what every mm -hmm. single one of those great therapists have invested in themselves to get education outside of the formal physical therapy training. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I said, some of them, uh, we, we've got many in our organization who are master clinicians, yeah. and I refer patients to them with great confidence. They are fabulous clinicians. I just, can I just add two things? And I want to see if, if you maybe generally agree with it. We talked a little bit. Of, you always, I always know that you, if someone says, hey, what's your take on this particular case or whatever, you always say it depends, Right. Um, or that's one of the things that, you, that usually comes out of your mouth. Or, and I would say many good trainers or clinicians will also take that approach. And we kind of talked a little bit about this, is that I think there's a little bit of shortcutting going on where people will just kind of, and I can speak more with maybe more authority or confidence on the training side, of course, is that people will just say, hey, here's a set of exercises that you kind of need to do and not look at it as like, well, it depends. And let me really look at that individual and understand you know, all the different uh, issues and look at them holistically and get to the root cause or whatever. So I feel like there's almost as much as we know, like you need to take an individualized or tailored approach to training or, or, or to assessing a patient. I sometimes feel like we're also short moving towards more shortcuts these days. So that's one. And then the second part I almost feel, and maybe this is not so much with, with physical therapy, maybe more so with GPs, is there's a lack of hands-on assessing or treatment. And I'll give you a, a personal example. So four or five years ago, um, walking to work and my, and my upper thoracic spine or mid thoracic spine just kind of seized up. And I didn't really know what it was. It was the first time that kind of happened. Went to, went to the GP. He didn't even touch my back or anything like that. And, and, and he just said, take some time and all or whatever. Obviously, I knew that there was something more than that. And so I went to a Cairo that I, I trusted. 
And he said, well, Rupesh, you're, you're, you know, did his assessment very good, sort of has that clinical eye and said that your rib is subluxed, you know, and, and it's not rotating and, and kind of really talking about the mechanism of, 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 of my pain and was able to adjust it and, and everything just kind of relaxed itself and I was able to move forward. But I, and I've heard this story many times from colleagues and friends where, where their therapists or, or GPs don't even put their hands on them. Do you think that that is something that's an issue? Well, of course. Yeah. There's, there's very few back pain experts among uh, general practitioners, but they can't be. They, they, their sure. job yeah. is to do an initial triage and impression and then get them to someone who then can do a thorough assessment. So some GPs will say, oh, well, uh, geez, uh, we better send you off for an MRI or whatever, uh, which may or may not be appropriate. But I was, I was listening to that, and what was going through my mind was, you know, w when you were at, at the university, we would get fabulous coaches and therapists to come and visit. And I think of every single one of them did an assessment, had a lot of tools in their toolbox, and every single one of them answered the question of anything to do with a human with it depends. Mm -hmm. And they knew how to consume information. So th there would be some coaches. You know, I think of a guy like Dan Paff. Now I'm going to name some coaches. Every single one of these coaches produces world record athletes one after another. Everyone can get lucky and produce one Olympian. Mm. Go produce 20. Mm. And now take them from a place of injury and pain, either they, you're a knee expert or you're, a, you're a, a back pain expert. Now take those people from back pain through to the podium in the Olympics or in international competition. We've done this a few hundred times. You know, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll hold that record up against all of these people on social media who say that. But in every single case, you know, let, let's look at Olympic sprints. What coach in the world has produced more world-class sprinters? And I would say Dan Paff from Arizona. Mm, okay. You know, I would go and consult with an Olympic program several in Europe. In the States, it's all fractured. The Olympic training program in the States is really in the universities, mm -hmm. different university programs. And I, they'd call me in and say, you know, we're getting a back problem. Could you come in? And, and uh, I'd, I'd work, workshop with them a bit. And then they'd say, you know what? You said exactly what Dan Paff said. He was here three months ago. And that happened. I, Dan and I have laughed about this many times. Now, he's a speed guy who produces the fastest sprinters in the world mm -hmm. he values core stability hip mobility relaxation pulse strength cycling the psychological ability to produce that relaxation and quick pulses uh, i mean dan but dan he can he can see the pattern from a mile mm -hmm. away and mm -hmm. you know I, I, dan started out as a high school physics teacher but then mm. became a master of the craft by studying all of these uh, pertinent right. uh, areas. But it's the same thing. It's strategic tuning of the body. He knows when to use a little bit. You know, I, I think of a, we had a, a double Olympian. I think th this person was around when, when you were uh, there. And we did what we could to get rid of their back pain. Mm -hmm. And 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 they were two sport, summer Olympics, winter Olympics, mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't, I didn't have the skill. The last little bit, they had this little nag in in quadratus lumborum that was just holding them back. I sent them to a soft tissue guru, who some people will say, oh, soft tissue work. Are you mm -hmm. kidding me? Every single sprinter in the world has, mm -hmm. a, has a soft tissue guru who knows what to release and what to, to leave right. tight and, and stiff and stable. You know, and I, I, I think of uh, American football. You know, who's producing guys who are just getting into the combine one after another? Joe DeFranco. It's the same principles. Who's in baseball? 
Eric Cressy produces fabulous baseball players. If I have a baseball player with, with back pain in the U.S., I send them to Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Boyle is another one who mm -hmm. follows the, the, the tuning of the body with strategic mobility, stability, proper movement patterns, taking stress out of one area of the body through posture changed and putting it into somewhere else that's more robust at the time. Um, he builds fabulous baseball. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Kelly Starrett. Have you ever seen that book, no. Supple Le Leopard? Kelly and I have shared a few National League baseball players and got them back to... I can go to mixed martial arts. John Chamberg, a right. guy yeah. who's produced fabulous uh, mixed martial artists. Um, uh, anyway, I can go on and on mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them follows this idea of doing an assessment and then understanding why the person is in pain, and then choosing the appropriate tool. Their knee needs a little bit of therapy. Right. That will then unleash their hamstrings that are getting hung up. Uh, it's going into the hip, it's rotating their pelvis, it's just tweaking their back a little bit, or it's creating an energy leak. Anyway, I can go on and on and on. They all do the same thing. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, so, you, you, you know, I, we, we, again, we, we, I'm, I'm, I know in podcasts it comes out of my mouth, oh, trainers do this or therapists do that or chiropractors do this. And I, I get mad at myself. It's, it's sloppy. There is the profession of each of these. And then there are the individuals. Some are terrible, just don't get it. And uh, others are absolute masters of the craft. So I've named some masters of the craft. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've worked with them all, uh, and uh, they produce results for a reason. And they follow the science and build these magnificent athletes out of pain. Anyway, does that... Yes, give uh, it, it's a yeah. bit of an essay and it was long-winded and i'm no, sorry about that no <laughs> don't ever apologize to um i do want to i i work I, I i guess it's sort of the tail end of of the conversation that i wanted to have and you have with you i, I did want to spend maybe a couple minutes on just talking about technology because i think and i and i generally i think i know where you stand on some of this stuff but but i haven't really been following tech when it comes to low back pain and and anything that's kind of out there is there is there anything I know you might say it depends, but but is is there anything that you feel like is sort of promising or for maybe technology that people should be aware of that supports low back health or I, 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 I did I had a colleague who had asked me that question wondering that and I and I really couldn't give him a, a solid answer because I haven't been following this at all, but anything? Yeah, the answer is obviously it depends, and I'm sorry yeah, for yeah, that, yeah, but that's yeah, the yeah. truth. So I think of uh, a good assessment of a person with back pain is low tech. It okay. is uh, putting them in and under, putting them into different postures, under different loads, into different activities, and seeing what causes pain and knowing enough about the spine work, how the spine works to know what tissues are you loading. Let's test the SI joints. Let's test the supraspinous ligament. Let's pull on the fifth lumbar sciatic root. Let's play with L3 on a femoral mm -hmm. root. And these are all subtle clinical techniques. None of them are high tech. Right. Uh, it's hard to find a clinician. I, I hope we train them, but and that, that sounds self-serving, but uh, we, we try and teach the art of assessment, which is all low-tech. But I'll, I would make bets of large amounts of money. I can predict what's going to be the painful uh, tissue. You're going to see it on, on an MRI and uh, et cetera. But at least we have the context to interpret an MRI because we've seen the, the person. So that would be the start of my answer. Mm -hmm. Something that would be a technical game changer is something that can restore the natural height of a disc. So when you have a disc bulge, mm. an end plate fracture, it just changes the mechanics of the joint. So you lose a little bit of height. You know you let a little air out of your car tire, and the car, uh, the tire now bulges, but it's sloppy on the road. And it's so funny, you know, you see these people on social media, oh, micro-movements in the joint have never been shown to cause pain. 
are you kidding? We see it in every single person. Mm-hmm. You just watch them under video flora, flora, fluoroscopy mm-hmm. and you'll see the micro movements perfectly correlating with trigger, triggering pain. And you, you mm-hmm. see it in whiplash people who, oh, you've got no signs on your MRI of whiplash. You're a pain magnifier. Wait a second. Watch the neck move under video fluoroscopy and you'll see, oh, there is the little micro movement occurring right when the when the pain triggers. So if you could plump that disc back up again and give it what we call turgor and stiffness mm-hmm. and really uh, change the loading of the facet joints, which they tend to go arthritic, uh, the ligamentum flavum gets hypertrophied. A lot of negative things happen when you lose a bit right. of disc height. So that would be a game changer. And we've tried. I've tried to play with uh, artificial nucleus, uh, doing kyphoplasties and all these kinds of things. Stem cells, a thing? Can that help in oh, any way? Well, I've not seen any evidence of stem cells into the nucleus of the disc. I don't know if there's enough uh, bioactivity in there okay. To, okay. To, to really, yep. uh, and, and the game changer there is you've got to seal the end plate first. Mm. And I've tried to do that with bone cement and kyphoplasties and, and these okay. kinds of things, and we've always failed. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but that too would be a game changer. I don't know if it's through stem cells, but I will tell you this. We have fabulous results uh, using stem cells on muscle tears. So if we have an athlete, I can give you an example. Uh, We had an Olympic uh, gymnast who said, you know, every time I extend my back, I get a pain and it's right there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we got out our Doppler ultrasound and I, I put it over where the pain was. And when, you know, when a muscle contracts, it knits mm-hmm. together like this. This is how a muscle shortens. And then I said, do this. <laughs> In other words, rapidly contract and relax the muscle. And you would see the muscle contract like this, except where the tear was. It would contract and then pull apart right at that level. Mm-hmm. So that was the t- contraction dynamic. So, you know, in those days, uh, if you need uh, needed a, a surgical repair, I'd send him to Ray Brown in in Montreal. He 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 did all the NHL hockey players. You had a sportsman's hernia or a tear, an external or internal oblique. Ray Brown, fabulous guru. He had the hands right. to to do it. Now Ray's retired, and another person's taken over that. But anyway, getting back to the story. Now, what other tools do we have that's non-surgical? Because obviously Ray was the the last resort. Rest. Okay. Can we get that muscle to rest? And uh, can we allow that knitting together with the fascia and muscle fibers? Um, Sometimes it was successful. But hold on now. We're into Olympic trials in three months. This is a big deal for that athlete. So we're Mm -hmm. under a time pressure. So now I send them off to Tony Gallia, who, uh, you know, world-known expert, and he has various uh, cocktails uh, that uh, I think usually involve PRP. And, and This is Tiger's Doctor, I think, at one point, right? It was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but, you know, yeah. Tony has, you know, world-class athletes coming through because he knows his stuff. He's, mm-hmm. he's tremendously talented. And there are cocktails of of things that help the healing and uh, they help that mu- muscle knit together so so tendon uh, muscle uh, that's that you're trying to achieve more normal dynamics in PRP is is magical but here's the thing it has to be delivered to the location so Tony mm-hmm. uses very high resolution and his ultrasonographers are geniuses once again they're not just someone at the hospital right the the the, the, the fella at, at Tony's place. He's, I've never seen any, anyone like it. And mm. I'll reveal, uh, Tony, uh, did my, uh, clavic, chromio clavicular joint two, mm. two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, j- just, uh, it, 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 he's a master. So anyway, when you ask me that, uh, there you go. Stem cells yeah. inside the nucleus. I don't know about yet. Mm. I haven't seen any thing that's that's really hopeful for me outside of the disc fabulous if you've got a stuck nerve sometimes 
uh, whether it's PRP or another chemical, can just let the impingement and little micro adhesion mm -hmm. go. So now the nerve slides. All of a sudden, the person's sciatica sure. is gone. Yeah. So, so you know, there's a time and a place, but the expertise of the clinician who understands the precise cocktail and the precision of delivery, paramount. Matters. Yeah. It it it, it matters. So uh, several lessons there. The yeah. skill of the clinician matters a lot. And here's another thing on social media. Again, clinicians get painted as a group, which I'm guilty of myself. Oh, you know, physiatrists do do this. Sure. Wait, yeah. wait a second. I know some fabulous yeah. physiatrists. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we're all uh, we're all guilty. And uh, oh, yeah. When uh, this year obviously has been really difficult for people with the pandemic working from home. We know that prolonged sitting is obviously a major mechanism for pain, but you're also seeing shifts to people standing. I'm standing right now. I spend, you know, 80% of my workday standing. Um, I'm going to shift my sitting posture for you there. <laughs> <laughs> Demonstrating what needs to happen. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. so, but what's, what's, What's sort of the latest research that's on 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 standing? Um, what's what are what are they saying about it? Because I can't imagine that standing all day could be very good. Our joint our joints need to move. I'm always thinking about my hips because I feel like they're that constant load that's in that one position. Um, I always try to whenever I at the end of the day if I squat my my SI joint or my sacrum, there's always a little bit of a pop. Um, that happens because I've just been standing and been static for so long, and I know that's not a good thing. But what's uh, do you know if there's been research done or what the research is showing around standing desks? Uh, I, I I wish I could assess your pelvic ring for you there, uh, Rupesh. But anyway, I so yeah. yeah um, I I uh, full disclosure, I haven't been keeping up in the with the okay. literature for the okay. last couple of years. But prior to that. Uh, what I would say there is, of course, the answer is it depends. Um, consider this as a philosophy. You know, some people say, oh, studies show that sitting is good. Other people, other studies show that sitting doesn't matter. Other studies show that sitting is bad. Wait a second. It depends. You've got to look at the cumulative exposure. And, you know, we, we spent a mm -hmm. lot of time mm -hmm. on that one uh, in the laboratory. So if your job was to sit all day, sitting more is harmful. Mm -hmm. But if your job is to stand all day, you work on an assembly line, sitting suddenly became the rest break. It was the mechanical opposite. Mm -hmm. It migrated stress from the tissues that were involved with standing to sitting. You know, people say, oh, well, this sitting slouch, there's no evidence for that. Well, hold on now. Um, if, if, if you have no pain triggers and you sit slouch for a while, that's not a bad thing to do. You just migrated the stress onto the disc and the ligaments. Now I'm going to sit upright. Well, if you sit upright on a stool for several hours, the muscles now become very achy because they are required to create a guy wire system to hold that posture. There's, mm -hmm. there's no load to speak of on the ligaments, but that's not the way to sit for a long period of time. So where, where the science always was, and I don't think there's any change on this, it's context specific keep changing the supporting role of different tissues through posture change until there's a problem. And then mm. if someone's damaged a specific tissue, the game changes a little bit and you have to move away from uh, that, obviously. So if they are triggered by sitting slouched, it's probably a good idea not to sit slouched for sure. a while. So there's many yeah. different strategies. You can sit with a lumbar support. You can stand or you can simply teach a person what are the postures that trigger their pain because no one ever pointed it out to them before and they don't have the awareness to know. Some people know right away, hey, when I do that, it hurts. I'm not going to do it. But those aren't the people who end up g going for therapy. They they're, they're, they're somehow have that innate savviness and and you know, <laughs> yeah. anyway, it, that's the summary of yeah. uh, the science. And uh, if you don't have an orthopedic problem, just keep changing your posture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, and if you stand a long time, sit. It's a therapy. Yeah. But yeah. if you sit all day, you better stand. That's the therapy. You, you get what I uh, of course, mean. Of course. But, but that's, again, these people are so passionate on the internet. Oh, someone said this statement. 
wait a second, what was the context that they said the statement in? And if you need a context to deliver information and you need a context to consume information. And that's where the disconnect is. Mm -hmm. Thanks for entertaining that question. I, I do want to move on to just some final, maybe rapid fire questions, if I could. I, I feel like I, I feel <laughs> These I've are only the gotcha ones. I've only got a, I've only got a couple, anyways. So they're not. And Michelle always tells me she's like they're not really rapid fire. They're really sort of deep thinking. So I don't even maybe know how to do rapid fire questions. Uh, I, I maybe at one point though, I, I feel like I do have to nerd out with you on high performance athletes because Stu, I can't let go of that stuff. Like it's it's. I still think about how to train athletes. I can't let go of that that piece. So I would love to have a future conversation about uh, about that. But uh, I do want to move on because uh, well, that could be it's, another it's, one. That's uh, yeah, maybe as you know, yeah. that's uh, one of my uh, passions as well. To yeah, uh, yeah, it's not every day you get to drive an F one race car. So when yeah. you're in our business, we get to drive an F one equivalent in speed, strength, power. Game, what a thrill! Yeah, game. Uh, yeah. What's the ga game? Game intelligence. Yeah. Situational yeah. IQ is what some of the coaches call it. Just yeah. those. Those are that are so coachable. Oh, it's fabulous. <laughs> uh, before we get into this rapid fire, I just want to make people aware of a couple of resources of Stu. So um, I'll, I will put these in the show notes for people. Uh, Backfitpro.com is, is Stu's website. There's fantastic resources on there. A lot of evidence-based uh, material. Stu's got his books and his DVDs. I got a couple in the back, which are a little outdated, Stu. I apologize. I haven't uh, bought your latest versions, but I suspect a lot of the wisdom, original wisdom is still in your in your new material. Um, I do recommend uh, folks, if they're experiencing back pain and they can't get to uh, one of Stu's master clinicians or they don't have access to that, um, the, ba the back mechanic book that Stu did is, is fantastic. It's more on, you know, it's, I think it's Stu and, and feel free to jump in, but my, I, my read of that was more of like, it's more suited to the, to the general public. And, um, I don't know if you, if there's anything you want to say on that particular book or. If Only I that, that it was or, the most, it was easy for me to write my medical textbooks. That, that was my world. <laughs> it was the most difficult to write back mechanic really? with the audience being the lay public because it was a dan well the original publisher said you have to have the title fix your back in three easy steps and i said well that's a lie i'm not doing it <laughs> and they said good well you won't sell many many books and uh, uh but i couldn't do it so i wrote mm -hmm. 17 chapters it takes the person through a self-assessment of their pain triggers and then gives them movement hacks around the triggers to help avoid the cause. So that's spine hygiene, etc. And then shows them how to build a base foundation. Now it's not going to take you to the Olympics. Those are the other books. But just to get out of pain uh, and through follow-up, we know it helps 95% of mm. readers. It doesn't help everybody. Uh, but no, no book can. But at least uh, that. But it was difficult in that I had to do the dance between giving enough information so it has scientific integrity and guiding people through a self-assessment, but still make it consumable and not a heavy right. medical text. And that took me five years to write that book, mm. to, to, mm. to do the dance and try and achieve a balance. If folks want to find um, your one of your master clinicians, if they want to go see them, is there like a, a repository on your website or somewhere where people can can locate these these clinicians or right. how would they go about that? Well, you go to backfitpro.com and you enter. There's there's an enter portal for clinicians and an entry portal for patients. And okay. then you enter in through patients and look for those. Those are master clinicians. They're listed by country and who they are and their contact. And then we have those certified who I haven't worked with and I, I cannot vouch for their uh, efficacy. However, they've taken our courses and they've passed both a physical exam, working mm -hmm. on patients, plus uh, a written uh, exam. But I haven't worked with them personally. Those are the certified people. So there's uh, a few more. Fantastic. All right. So first, uh, first question here, dead or alive, who are the five people who you'd want to have a meal with? Uh, I've been asked variants of that question before. Okay. And uh, so I guess my, my answer really doesn't change. Uh, the first one I would have to say is Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. 
the as you know I have two libraries here one's on Muhammad Ali and, and one's on Bruce Lee so the second one is Bruce Lee mm. uh, boy there was a lot more to that man than most people uh, realize uh, the third one, and only because I've been interested in this Black Lives Matter social uh, movement, and Malcolm X. Hmm. I've listened to Malcolm X uh, speeches, and uh, he, he was uh, very, very special too. I, I, uh, I have problems with why he triggered reactions, uh, because to me, he made so much sense. Well, I think just to jump in there, we did an episode on, on Hugh Hefner because he was somewhat surprising to us as someone who just was very transformative during his time. And he actually had Malcolm X on one of his Playboy interviews. And the, I, from my understanding, the challenge with Mal Malcolm X is that, especially with Martin Luther King preaching sort of a nonviolence approach, Malcolm X was very much on the, on the other side. And he was saying some really, some things that were, were very hard to hear at that time. Um, so very interesting that you'd have Malcolm X. That you're, yeah, you're yeah, no, yeah. for sure I would. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I would. Um, let me see now. I, I don't want to sound. Well, I'll just say it. Jesus, there, there's, okay. there, there's, there's someone else. And the last one might not surprise you. Uh, it would be my father, hmm. uh, who uh, didn't live very long, and. Uh, I'd like him to know that uh, maybe I turned out s somewhat okay. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and the last question is, what is something in life beyond we know the circle of life exists? What's something beyond something in life that you know for sure? One part of me wants to say nothing. And uh, another part would be more of a humanist answer and that would be the same answer that I mentioned to you earlier about our business of seeing people in pain and attracting uh, people who others look up to mm. as business leaders, sportsmen, world leaders, etc. And at the end of the day, you realize they're just people, but people strip down to their base because of pain. Mm. So I, I know people are people. Yeah. Thank you, Stu. I, I, um, it goes without saying, but uh, appreciate you as a person, appreciate the time that you've given me today. Appreciate that you're willing to have a conversation about something that maybe you're not always comfortable with. Uh, I think I have no doubt that people would have benefited from this conversation. Hope to do this again. And just again, thank you for taking time on a Sunday, uh, which I, I suspect is uh, precious to you. So, so thank you for that. Thanks, Rupesh. Um, you know, at this stage of my uh, career, I can go back and, and look at those uh, students who uh, I feel so good about. And if I can have a, well, uh, these conversations that we're having today, it takes me back to those days of having our beers and peanuts. And Anyway, you, you still give me great joy, as you always have done. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Steve. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.